there's a lot of companies that still today have individuals in, in place that rather than teaching someone how to fish, they'll just give them a fish. And in my opinion, that's the wrong approach. Board design isn't just, let's just draft something on paper. And it, it's, it's more than that. It's true printed circuit engineering at, you know, at, at, its, at its core. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the On Track podcast. I am Zach Peterson. I am your guest host for the next couple weeks. Uh, Judy Warner is out of the office planning Ultium Live 2022. Uh, She will be back shortly and resume her position as the uh, regular host of the On Track podcast. Uh, Today, I am here with Steven Chavez, chairman of PCEA, and also uh, he works at a major aerospace OEM and uh, he's got tons of knowledge that he loves to share, and that's kind of the mission of the PCEA as well, is to aid that knowledge transfer to new designers. Welcome to Altium's On Track podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Stephen, thank you so much for being here on the On Track podcast. Uh, it's my pleasure and uh, an honor to be here. Uh, this is a, a great platform and of continued uh, development and uh, education for designers going forward. So this is great. Uh, great job you guys are doing here. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you, uh, you've been on the podcast before. Um, I, mm-hmm. I'm not sure the exact date, but we'll link to that in the show notes. Um, sure. Since that time, you know, working in the electronics industry, things change so quickly. And one thing that seems to have not changed, and it's an area where PCEA is is active, is uh, knowledge transfer. And that's kind of a theme that we've been talking about with multiple hosts or multiple guests, I should say, uh, on mm-hmm. the podcast. Um, I know that you have a, a, a really broad depth yeah. of experience in the industry, so maybe you can tell our listeners a, a little bit about your experience and you know how you came to be affiliated with PCEA. Sure. So I would tell you uh, one of the, the, the fundamental things that that, that is I'm very passionate about is continuous development. Um, uh, you have to constantly be evolving in today's industry because it moves so quickly and things evolve uh, the way they do that... Uh, um, just attending a trade show or, or watching a video or, or a podcast one time and that's it, it it's not going to work. You, you've got to be on top of things as things change. And what maybe have been industry best practices yesterday may not be going forward the best practice because as things evolve. And uh, for me, uh, getting out uh, in the industry, attending the conferences, attending webinars, attending you know different shows or, or watching different podcasts, um, the content that's out there is amazing today versus years of past. And, and that's a huge evolution in our industry and how design and how design, uh, designing of printed circuit boards are evolving and has evolved. And it's a credit to the industry uh, as well as to today's designers, whether they'd be double E's or actual PCB designers, whoever's designing the boards. Uh, as today, it's a collaborative uh, uh, effort. It's not just a one man show anymore. Uh, years past so yeah totally agree with you i was actually uh talking to someone at a uh, commercial space company uh yesterday and last week and you know i was kind of asking them uh how do you guys operate and he said it's it's almost like it's constant uh organized chaos um everybody's (laughs) working with each other and everybody's helping each other put out each other's fires and the, the one takeaway I got from that was that, you know, what they're designing is incredibly complex. And I mean, you're in the aerospace industry. You you obviously understand all of this. And with that complexity comes the need for, you know, cross collaboration, the type of stuff that's enabled by like all team 365. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, that cross collaboration, how, how has that changed over the past, you know, however many years you've been in the industry? I mean, you're more experienced than I am. So I, I like to get that perspective. Yeah, so I would tell you, so in today, you know, we talk about the digital thread or model-based design. It starts from the very beginning. And, and today, you no longer have one or two individuals that, that are carrying the load for the entire company or, or team. 
Today you have a, a, a team of people doing it, and and with today's tool sets that high, are highly integrated, um, you know, in, in my case, you know, the tool that I used, the, the evolution of that tool and how it's evolved with its digital thread from, you know, uh, the start of it through uh, design, through uh, fabrication, through assembly, and then, you know, you talk about, you know, configuration management and how it's handled in its uh, product life management of the, the whole design itself. It, it, today's designs and today's tools are much more superior than of tools in the past. And taking advantage of that horsepower that's there, uh, in order to be uh, truly successful, you've got to be taking advantage of whatever tool you're using. Utilize that horsepower that's available to you rather than doing things in a manual approach. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people that have been very successful and continue to be successful. But the companies that are truly making uh, industry strides and, and really successful, they are utilizing the horsepower in their respective ecosystem and how they're designing boards. And as I see when I first started about over 30 years ago to where I am today, uh, that's one thing I would tell you where I have changed is I now trust my tool. And that doesn't mean I just push the button and then let it fly. I control in the chaos, as you, you described, I control that chaos. And a, a lot of it, um, you know, it stems from my military background in the Marine Corps and being able to handle chaos. And really, for me, in the, you know, when you think of the, the design cycle itself, uh, how one reacts under battle uh, conditions or in, in the true design when you're under the gun, under the wire, how you handle that, you know, it, everyone reacts differently. And um, I've been very successful with the tools that I use and, and how I wield it. And I think, you know, when I think of the designers today, those designers that are really successful really um, have mastered their craft as well as their tool. And, and in design, you've got to do both. You can't just master the tool and not master how to design boards. You've got to know how to design boards and then how to do it within your ecosystem or the tool that you're using. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think part of the the issue with with you know, knowledge transfer and, you know, bringing up that next generation of designers, you know, obviously mm -hmm. tool training is important, like you mentioned, and unlocking all of the, the little secrets within whatever CAD tool it is you're using. Um, mm -hmm. However, board design and some of the contemporary issues <laughs> in board design, I think are, are things that used to be the exception and have now become the norm. And so as that shift has been made, stuff like high speed, stuff like understanding things that happen at high frequency, as that becomes the norm, a lot of designers kind of get left in the past. And so they need to have those sure. resources to be able to come up to speed and understand that, yeah, this stuff is regular. You know, it's not an exception design. It's not No, you're super absolutely advanced. right. And, and that's, you know, my involvement early on in, in my early stage in my career of getting involved with IPC, uh, that was the kickstart. If we look at the how my career has evolved. And, and I, the way I describe my career is exponentially. I, I can pinpoint a time in my career when I, I effectively started to use one specific tool uh, along with uh, getting involved with IBC. Uh, it's one thing to use the specs. It's another thing to get involved, get involved with the committees. And, and the way I describe it is uh, get off the bleachers and get into the game. And, uh, you know, uh, then I started to really, you know, um, find other individuals that had the same knack, if you want to describe it, as the same knack, and, and you start cross-collaborating, and that is what makes a difference. And as I evolved, and now that I'm chairman of PCA, um, my passion is giving back to the industry, and, and what I want to do of collaborate, educate, and inspire, uh, which is at the core of our mission statement, is just that, it is I remember Steph when he was just starting out. Now, how can I ease Steph and help him uh, back then or someone like him that didn't know where to go, couldn't find a university that teaches this stuff. And, and, and rather than learning the school of hard knocks and, and drudging through five or 10 years of a brutal, uh, you know, getting off the ground in your career, get into a collective hub where you can have individuals like myself, you know, Mike Creedon, Rick Hartley, Gary Ferrari, Susie Webb and such. Uh, and as a yourself, uh, out there talking and sharing knowledge and willing to share. And that's a difference. And one thing I, I noticed from when I started out, people weren't so eager to share knowledge because it was all about keeping their job. Whereas now it's more open. People are willing to share and willing to help each other. And 
that's the difference that I see that has evolved to the designers today. That's really interesting. It it almost seems like some of that design knowledge may have been viewed as like a trade secret, proprietary yeah. information. Is is that really the mentality that that you know was? It, it was early on that it was the mentality of you know what I, I I'm not going to tell you how I did it. You just just give it to me and I'll do it. And there's a lot of companies that still today have individuals in place that rather than teaching someone how to fish, they'll just give them a fish. And in my opinion, that's the wrong approach. And when we think of mentorship, which is, you know, what we do here at PCA is we want to mentor uh, the younger generation, or what we call the next generation engineers, uh, to learn how to fish and, and, and to do better and take it to the next level. Because the industry is evolving, like we talked about, our tools are evolving and it's getting more and more of a challenge as things are getting smaller, they're getting condensed, there's more things that we got to rely on, you know, and we talk about, you know, reliability, talk about producibility, there's so many different aspects as speeds increase, thermal becomes an issue and board design isn't just, let's just draft something on paper and it, it's it's more than that. It's true printed circuit engineering, at, you know, at, at its at its core. Well, that's why I love the PCE and PCEA, like you say, it is printed circuit engineering because I think it does take mm-hmm. an engineering mindset, not just in terms of how do I get to a good design, but what are the trade-offs? And I know that's something I talk a lot about in my uh, in my own research in terms of optimization. But you know, mm-hmm. Rick Hartley did a, a great uh, a great uh, presentation on PCB design optimization and talking about that type of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. so I, I totally get what you're saying when you say printed circuit engineering and, and definitely agree with you, mm-hmm. but you know, there, there's one thing that, um, I think is interesting in terms of how, uh, the industry has progressed and, and some newer designers are kind of getting left behind, which I think is something where you're really knowledgeable, which is dealing with your manufacturer, how to work with your manufacturer. It, it's mm-hmm. at least for me being a younger, you know, younger person in this industry, um, I try and learn as much as I can about manufacturing and it's an area where, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not a manufacturer. I'm not at expert level yet, sure. but I'm, I really want to get there because we do have to design boards for manufacturing. And mm-hmm. I'm sure that's even more true in the aerospace industry where things have to have high reliability. They have oh, to be. It's, it's much more. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, when we think of aerospace, you know, in, in general, let's just think about commercial side of it. The whole essence of aerospace is moving people safely in the air. And you have to always have that mindset in place because uh, safety is paramount, especially when it comes to you know people flying. And so reliability and, and, and producibility is key. And when you're designing uh, circuit boards, you've got to always keep that in mind of the decisions you make in your current state in your design, whether you're designing the schematics or you're designing the layout, You got to understand the impact you make downstream and good designers know this and they're aware of this. For example, if you're picking a connector with a certain type uh, of pin pitch or you're you're choosing a part that is like a micro BGA, you are automatically pinning yourself into a category of complexity that is at a higher level. Do you understand what you're already boxing yourself in a corner into? And you'd be surprised how many people don't realize that. And they could make it more cost effective. They don't have to make it that small or choose that particular part and the downstream effect it has in assembly uh, when they're doing this. And this is where, you know, when you think of, you know, what I refer to as a designer's triangle where you got, you know, your layout solvability, then you have your performance, uh, whether it's SI, PI and thermal, and then you have your DFM. You've got to make sure that you're covering all three bases to be successful. So your first design you design, when you pull the trigger and fab it, you're successful. You're not going to have any any surprises downstream. And, you know, when you talk about producibility, you want to make sure that you design a board that, whether it's the first board or the thousandth board, it functions the same regardless. And it can be built the same. Whereas, you know, one of my, in my early stages of my career, one of my early mentors said, any circuit board can be built one time at a serious premium cost, but it can be built somewhere in the world. Somebody can build it, but that's not what you are. Your goal is as a designer. Your goal is to design a board that can be fabricated anywhere, any place, and any time, whether it's fabricated or assembled. Uh, so... That's always been my mindset is how to design a board so that way it always meets the sweet spot 
uh, within that, that uh, fabricator and assembly. And so it's, it's imperative that when you think about the design itself or the design cycle, that you all have the appropriate stakeholders in the beginning of that process. That includes your fabricator, that includes your assembler. And when you think of the education of your design team, your young double E's, your young PCB designers, and even mechanical, they, they need to visit a fab shop, they need to visit an assembly shop, so they understand all the intricate details that go into designing that board, so they know that when they make the requirements in their documents, whether to fab it or assemble it, they understand what they're saying. So that way it's a smooth transition uh, from within the design, then to fabrication, then to assembly, and then eventually into test. And so it's a, it's a truly integrated system. And when you think of the digital thread within our tools and how we use it, uh, it it's, it's amazing from where the manual approach of what we did in years past. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Uh, uh, you bring up, you know, talking to your fabricator and possibly even going and visiting your fabricator if you can. Um, I mean, I totally mm -hmm. agree with you. I, I think, you know, maybe you're in the U.S., your fabricator's in Europe. Maybe that's not feasible, but... It, it doesn't even have to be your current fabricator. It, just visit a fabricator. They sure. Will, they, they, will, they will trip over themselves to help show you and, and enlighten you uh, in their process to make it easier, believe me. Well, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you know, they're going to want your, they're hoping to get your visit, uh, business at some point. Oh, sure. Yeah, if, if you're, they... You're absolutely right. And, and so it's there, the majority of fabricators are always willing to showcase the floor because, you know, in the end, let's be real, everyone's, you know, got to make a living. And of course, they're looking to hopefully win your business. And so a good, a good supplier um, isn't in it for a one or two PO that is a 10000 or even a $30,000 PO. They're after the 10-year, 20-year relationship, and a good supplier understands that. So they're all in. They'll be all in, even though they know that this prototype that they may be working with you, it may not go to them. It may go to a, a, a smaller firm or a smaller proto shop, uh, proto, uh, prototype shop, and they're okay with that because they're in it for the long haul of that relationship. So when you go to manufacturing or go to, when you go into true production, they're the house that you choose. And... So good, good companies, you know, uh, they understand that. And when it comes to training your people and getting, keeping them educated, it's advisable to at least your local fab shops, if you can get out there, go out there and give a tour and, and take your younglings or, or your uh, younglings, uh, take, the, take your younger generation engineers and let them undersee and let them see and understand, uh, you know, what it takes to fabricate and assemble a, a printed circuit board. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I mean, I when I was down at uh, PCB West uh, just a couple months ago, um, we got to go tour factory, and it's it's really mm -hmm. eye opening. You know, it's not my first factory tour, but seeing that particular facility was really eye opening, and how they have everything organized, and what their capabilities are, what the machines they use yeah. actually do, and it just mm -hmm. kind of gets your wheels turning as far as you know how can I design this better so that it's streamlined through their process. And I guess it's not just about cost, but it's also about reliability and producibility, like you say. Um, Correct. And, and having them having them involved early on will increase your percentage for success uh, when you go to fabricate that board. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. To totally agree. I mean, my you know everyone who has ever watched any of my videos knows it's the catchphrase is I've kind of lifted it from, from Mike Creedon. So kudos to Mike Creedon for this. Uh, don't forget to call your fabricator. Oh, you were there. No, you're absolutely right. Yep. Mike is amazing. He's uh, like a brother to me, a uh, big brother, uh, definitely a mentor of mine. Uh, I love Mike. He's amazing. He's, he's good for the industry and we need him. We need uh, uh, gurus like him uh, spreading that knowledge and he's doing a hell of a job. Yeah, and there's, a, there's actually another uh, on-track podcast with Mike Creedon, so I'm going to link to that in the show notes because mm -hmm. um, that is also an eye-opening discussion and specifically mm -hmm. talking about PCEA. Um, yep. So, I mean, back on the, the topic of you know, manufacturing, I mean, if you're, if you're like a large company, you're probably working with one or two suppliers. Maybe you've got your smaller mm -hmm. prototype shop. Maybe you've got your, your large full-scale producer. Sure. But, you know, yep. if, you're a, if you're a service bureau... Um, you may not have that luxury. Maybe you've got, maybe you're like, you know, what my company is where we've got like mm -hmm. a handful of business cards that we kind of farm out or, you know, shove out in front sure. of customers when they want to produce something. 
and say, you know, these guys can do this. These guys can do this. You want to produce at class three, I recommend these guys. And, you know, you kind of yep. give them the menu of options. I mean, when, mm -hmm. when you're in that position versus just working with one supplier, it seems that if you're working with the one supplier, you can just call them up and say, hey, is this going to work? And they're always going to be able to give you the yes or no. Is that is that the correct view? You know, it, it, in general, when it comes to being like a, um, uh, like a, a, a little firm or, or a service bureau, that, that is true in, in a sense where you are, you're not making the decision, the customer is making the decision on which shop to go to. So you are basically coming in as a hired gun to design whatever you need to design for them. And it's usually, uh, you know, at the, the end of the year is the worst. Like this time of year is always the, the peak of, of when they need support because they're trying to get it in. So that way it's all about timing. So that way when they come back from the new year, they've got a board in house ready to be tested and, and demos, whatever case may be. But um, you're right. It, it, and when it comes to service bureaus, um, they don't really have dedicated unless they are uh, a customer is coming to them and says, here's a widget. I want you to design this widget. And then you're going to do a full turnkey. Then you're going to go to your go-to houses that you go to. But in general, you're designing with the concept of I'm going to use whatever my customer is telling me to go to. So you've got to then sync up with them and and, and go from there. But uh, at, the, at its basis of design, you're using industry best practices. So it shouldn't really matter where you go. Um, when you're designing a board, you should not... Uh, tailor your designs to one specific supplier or another. You want to make it general so you can go anywhere. So when you're designing your boards, whether it's extremely complex or a very simplistic design, it's, it's at its base, it can go anywhere. Uh, you can send it to any company. So uh, good engineers understand this and they will apply this when they're designing their boards. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, especially with designing anywhere. Um, it, it seems that, uh, you know, sometimes a one CM or one fab house will get chosen. They may not hit the quality standard that the client wants. And so sure. round two, we go to someone else and you got to make sure that yeah, you can produce you know, in both I, places. I, I, you're absolutely right. And a lot of times, you know, you have um, in, in several, uh, you know, when I used to work for a design firm, a lot of the aerospace companies we tapped into, they had tier levels, tier one, tier two, tier three. And your tier ones are your big, big companies. Uh, and I won't mention their names, but they're, they're very large companies that, that, um, that the, most of these aerospace companies tie into. And um, you're right. Most of the times, you're, they're working directly with them. But when you get the, the mid-sized companies or even the small companies, you know, that's not to say these small fab shops and you know, small assembly shops, they can't bring it. Because some of them are just as amazing, if not even more so, because they're not as big and they can focus truly on just their core of what they're really good at. Um, but it's, it's on you as the engineers to make sure that you're filtering your suppliers and that you're on top of them to make sure that they meet the standard or the qualities that you're after. And a good shop will, will work with you to make sure that uh, they are, are meeting your requirements in that regard. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, what I'm hearing here is, uh, you know, high volume needs to be less complex if possible because you could take it to multiple different uh, suppliers if needed. And then you can ensure that you're actually going to have something that is reliable and hits your yield target and is producible and, and all of this. Whereas, you know, you, you brought up like a smaller, a smaller shop that might be more focused. Maybe they're more focused on high density. Maybe they're more focused on, I don't know, unique, unique material systems or whatever it may be. And they're going to be able to focus on you and hit your requirements. That, I mean, it's it's interesting because I, I think when a lot of new designers enter this sphere, they don't really make the distinction between those different types of manufacturers and what it no, means it, to it, manufacture it, it, a high volume versus designing the manufacturer for just quantity 10 or quantity one. Yeah, and, and a, lot of, a lot of people don't even realize in some of these large tier one level companies, it's like an umbrella because of all the acquisitions and mergers that happen within the industry uh, today. You may send it to the, the tier one shop. They're going to farm it out to who they, they're going to level load. And they're going to say, okay, this is a class three design. It's a multi-layer. It's got sequential lamination. It's HDI. We're going to send it to this shop. But the next go around, that shop may be, not be able to meet their requirements as in the delivery time. 
So then they're giving the customer, like let's say uh, uh, an aerospace company may say, hey, I need it now. I don't need it six or eight weeks from now. I need it sooner. So therefore, I, I want to send it somewhere else. Well, guess what? That other house may not be as qualified. And it's happened in my career where designs had to be dumbed down in order to send it to somewhere else. And it's a wrong approach to dumb down a design. But, you know, when, when supply chain starts moving things around um, and trying to cut cost and figure out why well, I can get it cheaper. Well, there's a reason why that place is available and there's a reason why they're cheaper because they don't they don't have the complexity. Everyone else is going to, you know, supplier A because supplier A can bring it. They're, they're a high quality house. And this is why they're this is why they're backed up. Everyone wants to go to them. Yeah, you get what you pay for. You get what you pay for. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it, it, it's it's a behoove you to know your suppliers and have a relationship with them and make sure you, you, you continue that developmental uh, relationship going forward um, all the time. Uh, whether you use them once or you use them continuously, um, I always say you never burn a bridge. You always want to keep that dialogue open and, and, uh, and moving forward. Yeah, uh, I one thing I I see often from newer designers is this idea of well, you know, I, I just want to produce it as cheap as possible, and it's mm. kind of a race to the zero or to zero on on cost, and it's it's not just like how do I design this so that it's as cheap as possible for components, but also for fab and then for assembly, and then I think people are too willing to sacrifice quality problems, even if it is just a prototype run. And it even gets to the point where I think it compromises performance as well. It's not just manufacturability, but people start eliminating planes. They start implementing bad routing and, and grounding practices. Yes. And they do all the stuff that's going to cause them to fail EMI and fail uh, fail SI, fail PI, whatever it may be. No, you're absolutely right. So the way I think of this is, is, is it's like mathematics. Uh, when you get into high complex mathematics, a lot of engineering students or a lot of people make mistakes at the rudimentary algebraic steps and so i think of design the same way uh, a lot of mistakes are made for simple you know concepts like are you routing a trace over its appropriate routing plane did you route it over a gap um, uh, between planes or in a moat i mean you know when you uh, uh transitioned from one layer to another did you use a transition via you know did you do this you know are you aware that you're running you know several gigahertz you know what did you do in your analysis? You know, if you're using IBIS models, did you, is it the IBIS model correct? You know, did you, where did you get the information from? You know, did you do any EMC checks and you went into EMI testing? Did you do, what did you do up front to prevent that? Because you don't want to design or you don't want to check for quality. You want to design quality into it. Uh, and that's always, you know, a concept that I say is you design for quality. You don't check for quality. And you got to do all that legwork up front. And believe me, it'll pay off. And it always seems like in the front, in the beginning of the project cycle, it's always slow at taking off. And, uh, you know, those companies that are doing their due diligence and doing their simulations and doing uh, all their checks up front, uh, it pays off in the long run because when they design their board, they're going to be successful in the lab. So that way it's, it's not, you know, a shot in the dark. And, you know, the magic really gets to happen there in the lab. Yeah, yeah. It, it sounds to me like, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm not the only one that says this. I actually had, we just recently had a talk with uh, Eric Bogatin, who, who said something mm -hmm. similar. Um, yep, which he's is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's great. Um, it, what he said was that um, people have uh, bad yardsticks. Like, what is your <laughs> yardstick for success? And it sounds like the the companies that are highly scalable, you said, you know, they're maybe it takes longer to start a project, but they're doing that due diligence up front to really define what success is. And so maybe it's not, you know, ultra low noise, but maybe it is compliance to a specific standard. Maybe it is producible with X number of fabricators. I don't, you know, I don't know what all those possible variations on yardsticks mm -hmm. are, but, you know, I kind of wonder how do you get there and how do you balance that? Is it just, yeah, especially with something like high reliability like aerospace is it just looking at industry standards is it based on testing is it based on simulation you know how, how do you balance well, all of that i would tell you it's, it's a it's a collaboration it's not just one area or the other it's it's a collective uh, 
uh, influence of all different aspects uh, when you think of design um, as a fully embedded approach or, or when you think of the ecosystem of design. Um, every, every link in that chain is equally important uh, in order for that chain to be strong. So when you think of design, you, know, you, you have your different roles that are played. You got your double A's, your EMC engineers, mechanical, you know, software, firmware. There's so many team members that contribute to the success of your design. Um, all that has to be taken, uh, you know, accounted for. And, and each person or each team member plays an important role in, in order for the entire project to be successful. So, you know, nowadays they, the budgets are smaller, the, the time to market is, is faster, uh, the windows are, uh, window of opportunity is, is less. So being able to do things faster is the key in uh, companies that get it, they're, they're applying this approach in, in how they utilize their team members. And, you know, one of the things when I think of, um, you know, early in my career is when is enough enough that you can pull the trigger and move on? Because in, in, in the end, getting the board in the lab and getting it in the double E's hands for testing is, you know, I would say that's where the true magic happens. You can do all the simulations, but that's theoretical. It's not until you actually get it in the lab to really find out, did, did, I, did, I, did it produce or did it, is, is the expectations of, of what I thought it was going to do, did it meet its requirements? If you do your due diligence up front, you're more, the percentages are higher and you're more likely to hit, you know, within that, that sweet spot of where you need to be. Whereas if you, if you don't, you know, you're guessing and you're hoping it works. And that's, that's a waste of money, a waste of time, and you, you, you're more likely to fail. Believe me, I've been there. Lessons learned in my career, early on in my career, um, you know, the teams that I've been on, I were, you know, I just started off and you got to start somewhere and you know, we all make the mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Lord knows I've made my share. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think sometimes we don't want to admit when we make those mistakes, especially on a critical run. Um, you mentioned the real <laughs> yeah. magic is is in the lab, and I totally agree with you. I mean, I so when I was you know teaching at a university, working at the graduate level, one thing I noticed was that um, the test and measurement. Uh, really, you know, theory, whether it's at the board level or, or any other level, um, mm -hmm. sometimes was lacking. And especially once you get into a graduate program, it's like you go into a lab and if there isn't someone there to like really walk you through an instrument, it's like, hey, here's the manual, you know, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Do you, I mean, what but, kinds of, no I, I'm wondering if that, you know, really contributes to. No, I, I would tell you, you, you're right. I mean, I when I started off in my career, I was a technician, an engineering technician. I wasn't a designer. I got the Marine Corps in avionics. Uh, that's what I did when I was in the Marine Corps. So when I got out, I thought I'd, you know, follow my career uh, as I was chasing my double E degree. And uh, I was a technician. So learning how to use scopes in measuring equipment and test equipment, there was really nobody there to teach you. You got to, like you just said, you pick up the manual and you start fumbling. How do you do this? And and hopefully you have some senior people that are in your in the lab with you that are help guide you because if not you, you're having to learn the hard way and it's not like like today where today you have you know application engineers that that are willing to come on site and walk you through on how to use their equipment then uh, or, or there's YouTube videos now oh my god YouTube is you can learn anything on YouTube and um, it's amazing uh, you know of what's available today uh, to learn but at the same time there's what I call a lot of noise out there in the industry and you got to be careful of what you pick up because they may not be best practice or it may be touted as best practice, but it's not really best practice. So you got to be careful of what is out there just as much as the good content that's out there. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I think one of the, the problems is that sometimes you see advice that was best practice in the past, but mm -hmm. now all of that context has been lost. It's like a big, long historical game of telephone where it worked fine in system A, and people try mm -hmm. and extend it into systems B, C, D, E, and F, and 30 years later, it actually stops working. So it's, it's almost like the guideline and the justification is taken out of context, and then that causes design practices to be misapplied. I've, I mean, for me, in my experience, the biggest one is, is split planes. Mm. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if you've seen any particular instances yourself of where that, that happens. Well, you know, what, what I have just seen is um, as I evolved in my career, um, a lot of good engineers that I have had the uh, pleasure of working with or the honor of working with, um, I've been very fortunate. They've guided me in the right path. Uh, but there were a lot of times where I just, the information that was handed to me you know, early on, it wasn't, I don't want to say it wasn't industry best practices, but it's what they used to be successful, but they, they were successful, but they were on the low end of the rail. So yeah, they were successful, but they were on the low end of just meeting their requirements and any deviation. And it's like below and failing, barely working, it's like skipping along. And you know what, that, that was my mindset early on. But as I said, you know, once I, I got involved with IPC and, and um, you know, I started using Mentor Graphics. Uh, you know, my career just took off. And uh, uh, it, it's, again, it's it's just um, mentorship is a big thing. This is why in PCEA, uh, it's really big on, on, on collaborating and sharing. And, uh, you know, we're too independent, so it doesn't make a difference what tool you use. Because in the end, you know, designing a circuit board is the key to designing, not uh, not the tool, it's the designer, the designer and the engineer uh, that, that make the difference. And do you understand what you're doing? And then mastering whatever tool you, you choose to use or whatever you are, you know, your ecosystem, because in the end, you're going to use whatever tool, whatever company hires you. And that's the tool you need to master and, and use it to your advantage. And it's behoove you to do that. And I always preach that you know, when I'm uh, teaching certification classes is to master the tool that you're using. It doesn't matter which tool uh, to take advantage of that horsepower and um, and to step out of your box of doing everything manually and look for ways to see how you can automate things to be faster and better. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely process to be followed, and I know that oh that, sure yeah that yes. helps streamline everything. But it's almost like the tools are just really just productivity machines it's not necessarily about like you're only going to be able to design this thing in this tool so you need to go buy this tool it's more up yeah, your skills right. your skills are what's the, going to the, get the design and not necessarily the tool. you're absolutely right and the tools are just a means to a, a, a result and it's up to you uh, on how you apply it to be successful i mean no matter which tool you're using and uh, today's tools are not like years past today's tools have a lot of the automation built into it I know there's always a lot of chatter whether I'm going to, let's say, for example, auto route. I'm going to auto route or I'm not going to auto route. Oh, I'll never auto route. I got to say early on in my career, I would tell you I'll never auto route a board. I would never think of it. Um, as I evolved and especially when I started working for a service bureau, I would tell you there are service bureaus that um, that are high end. I tell you, if you're not utilizing that auto router, you're not going to be successful with them. And you've, you've got to be faster and better because... That's what they're paying for. That's what they're paying those those top premium dollars. They want you to be better and faster and, and get that design done. And then you get into like design reuse and the and IP reuse and how you can do it. Uh, there's certain companies um, uh, that do this and that really do it very well. And uh, if you can take advantage of design reuse, I know that one of my recent projects, um, you know, we killed it uh, on design reuse and, and it's just... It's amazing how fast you can design a board uh, when you utilize the horsepower and the tool uh, or in the whole ecosystem. When you think of your MCAT ECAT collaboration, you think about, you know, uh, into your PLM system uh, and, and how you can tie into your, you know, your simulation, how you can tie into your DFM checks uh, within the full digital thread. Uh, by the time you're finished, there's no guesswork. You know, you already know what you're going to produce and you're just verifying that your design quality is there. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. In fact, that's that's kind of Altium's new push is that mm -hmm. collaboration and cross tool collaboration. I think you know you really hit it on the head. Mm -hmm. There, it's a realization that it's not just going to be one CAD program that gets you over the finish line because these things get so complex and there are so many different tasks. There's the mechanical. There's the firmware. There's you're absolutely right. Yeah, there's manufacturing. And, and there's 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 too much for one person to do it all. Don't get me wrong. There are people out there that are one-man shows. Uh, kudos to them. Um, but when you think about all the expertise that's required, it's, it's too much for one individual to uh, 
uh, to be able to be an expert at every one of those little things uh, because you're not doing it every day. And um, that's what I liked about working at a service bureau or for an, a small engineering firm that, that sold its services is because you are working on a diverse uh, set of uh, um, uh, projects uh, that cover a spectrum and you're having to push the envelope a lot of times to be faster and better and so you've got to learn uh, find ways how you can carve out time in the schedule uh, how you can shrink the schedule and you're not going to do that doing things manually because you can you're a human you can only work for so long you can only go for without sleep for so long believe me i know and um, i try not to do that and uh uh but, it, you know, it's, it's a challenge and it's a challenge of how, how can I be faster and better and have the quality be right there and not have to work more than 10 hours a day. Sure. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, it, yeah. And, and, and service bureaus, they, you know, uh, the really good ones, their team members are producing and that's what they're doing. They're taking advantage of the automation and their tools, whether it be any of the EDA tools that are out there. Because believe me, the service bureaus have to be able to use or have team members that use multiple uh, you know EDA tools in order to be for them to be successful and to thrive in business. Oh, absolutely. So, absolutely. In fact, a lot I yeah. I know that some service bureaus are they they win business based on that. Do you use this tool? Yes, we're yep. we're experts in it. Well then, great. You're going to get the job. We can't find anybody that's experts in this. No, you're absolutely yeah. right. You're absolutely right. And and, and being uh, you know, multifaceted in, in and multiple tools is a good thing. It's always good if you have the opportunity to learn another tool. Um, but in the end, you know, people are going to work with whatever tool they get hired into, and they'll assimilate to that tool. And uh, you know, my 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 you know recommendation to them is just learn to master that tool any way you can, and take advantage of the horsepower within that tool to be successful. And that may be a mix of automation and manual approach. But anywhere you can automate something, try to automate it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you brought up auto routing, and um, I I will admit I shy away from auto routing. Um, no, that's it's you know it's typical. Yeah, it's typical. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll admit that. Um, I'm I'm wondering though, since you know you you seem to have uh you your view is more welcoming of auto routing. Um, what do you see as more appropriate to auto route versus? something else like so when you think about like uh, um you know uh big buses or when you think of like um so like rf designs for example you got a lot of shapes if anything you're going to use like maybe reuse where you created a shape and you're going to reuse that shape and uh, so that's, that's exactly uh, what we know, do on some on rf, RF when you're when you're doing rf um uh the chances of auto routing are not slim to none uh, when I talk about utilizing horsepower, uh, you as a designer have to understand when to apply that power that you have and when you have to, uh, or the horsepower in your tool, or when you're going to have to do things manually. But you look for ways and look for opportunities. How can I make it so I can do it faster? And it comes from you know years of lessons learned. And, and you also have to be willing to say, here's my comfort zone. And I'm going to step outside this comfort zone and, and be willing to try something different or be willing to try this feature that's in the tool that we're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for. Uh, and it's in this tool, but I never use it. Why not? Well, why, why don't you try it? And if it doesn't work, why didn't it work? I guarantee you, if you talk to the FAEs of your tool, they'll say, yeah, we have customers using it all the time, you know, and it, but I'll be the first to tell you that it's, not every design can be auto routed. You just have to choose and, and, and control your auto router and when you can use it. And if you can, if you could save a day, two days, or a week and cut that off your design schedule, wouldn't you wanna do that? Because I guarantee you, your competitor is gonna do that. And when you think of uh, service bureaus, speed and quality is everything. Yeah, absolutely, you absolutely. Know? Yeah, and, and I almost see it as like, if you can plan smartly for auto routing and you can set up that automation with certain portions of the the design mm -hmm. it's probably going to work it's probably going to be hard to break it i one one example that comes to mind immediately is like i2c you know mm -hmm. i2c buses are kind of hard to break so mm -hmm. maybe that's a candidate for auto routing or a bunch of gpios 
Whereas I don't, I've never met anybody that would auto route like a DDR4 bus. Mm -hmm. So I would tell you, it just, you know, uh, the other day I was talking to someone and they're like, you know what, if you can't route, you know, DDR, if you can't route it, you know, within like 30 minutes to an hour, you're not using your tools, what, whichever tool you're using, you're wasting time. There's, there's times, you, that's time that can be spent downstream. And, and you should be able to do it faster, faster than years past. You know, you have to be willing to adapt and change. And it's just part of the evolution. I mean, think of the designers that were there before me and before you and where we are now. Look how we're evolving. And the tools are evolving so rapidly. And it's behoove us to take advantage of the, of the power and the tool to be better. Because I guarantee you at some point, and um, I just, uh, you know, I did an article with iConnect007 and regarding AI and the future of PCB design and what is the approach and what do I think? What is my opinion? In my opinion, you know, anywhere between 10, 15, maybe 20 years, who knows, some company or somebody is going to figure out how to have a computer design a board. And I tell you, when you think about the automation, um, when you're designing your constraints in your design, isn't that kind of what you're doing? You're putting your constraints in so that way you don't have to think about when you route interactively route a trace, the computer is already mining the rules that you put in there. So when, you know, I had this epiphany the other day when, when I finished the design and uh, we were, uh, you know, talking with our customer and, you know, we did the demo, the demo worked. It was amazing. It worked the first time out of the shoot and, and it was no surprise to us, but it's always good and rewarding when we hear from the customer and, uh, uh, instantly. And, uh, and I just thought, you know, we did that really fast. And the customer was like, it's amazing how fast you guys did this. And, and then I started thinking, well, what if, what if we had a machine to do it? Not me, but a machine. What if somewhere somebody had some algorithms or something and programmed a machine that took like lessons learned from hundreds of boards or thousands of boards and said, this is what we figured out when you route a power bus or when you're routing, you know, DDR4 or, or when you're routing, you know, you know, ethernet or whatever this is this is what you need to do and then all of a sudden you know you you think about how you can do it from a system architecture level and then you can work your way down now don't get me wrong i'm not saying that that uh, a designer can be replaced but at some point you know 10 20 years from now i can see the evolution following because look where we're progressing with ai right now and how far it's come so somewhere some company is 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 doing this or is down this path well i can tell you i know and have talked to the founders of one particular company that is doing this at the schematic level not at the physical level yet but definitely mm -hmm. definitely at the schematic level and their yeah. their tool does interface with altium designs um so yeah. yes you're you're right it, it is a good it is a trend that is happening and i think it's funny because sometimes you bring this up and then i think designers sometimes freak out and think oh there will never be pcb designers in the future this is you know a dying art or whatever whatever complaints they oh, want to no, they want to say i don't think so at all i think if you not go back all. to to the 1900s and you told people in 1900 that you know in the future only 0.2 percent or whatever percentage of people will be working on farms when at the time you know 30 percent of people worked on farms or something like that some huge percentage they sure, say, well, sure. what are what are people going to do for jobs? How are people going to you know have their livelihoods and all of this? And it's not that the the automation eliminates you; it's that it changes your role and refines it. No, you're absolutely right. So what's happening is we are seeing a hybrid approach of the designer nowadays. Nowadays, the doubly coming out of school is now the future designer. Why? Because think about what a company is willing to pay for. So. This day and age, a company doesn't want to pay someone a certain amount of money so that way he has peaks and valleys where he's busy for three months, four months, and all of a sudden he goes into a valley where he's not really busy. He's waiting for the next design cycle to come. Then he's busy again. They want a, a, a double E because when he's designed the board, he goes into the next phase. So his uh, return on investment to the company stays at a maximum output. So he's doing from design, he, then he goes into the firmware or whatever, whatever aspect. So when you think of today's designers uh, that are the future designers of tomorrow, 
the young designers today, they're the hybrid. They're they're a doubly uh, with a doubly background that are designing boards. And when you think about how complex our designs are getting, um, they they it's just a na- it's by nature it's evolving that way. Designers are having to become knowledgeable of the du- double E background, whereas the, des- the double E's are having to get the designer background. So you're getting like a hybrid approach and a, a blend of the two. And that's that's the next generation of designers. And then when you think of really downstream, like we talked about AI, the designer's not going away. The designer will just evolve. Somebody's got to control the system. Somebody's got to control how things are done. The design engineer will, will evolve. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know yeah. that uh, Altium is trying to be at the cutting edge of that and enable that type of collaboration and access to those tools to to help designers evolve. Just yeah, like it would say. be behoove of them to to not 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 chase after that that ring, that golden ring. I, I would tell you, uh, in my vision, I I see that at least how I see you know when I first started to where we are now, uh, whichever EDA company really embraces that and goes after it, they'll be the game changer. They'll be the game changer for sure. And uh, like you said, you know, you said you already know somebody that's just doing the schematic. I can tell you, you know, in the recent project I worked on, you know, we, you know, when we, when we talked about uh, the integration from our system architect into our schematic and into our layout, it, it was, it was very seamless in how their approach was. And it was as if we designed it at the system architect level by the time we got to layout and um, it was extremely effective and we were able to do it rather quickly uh, versus, you know, years past. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Well, I think for now we're going to have to leave it there because we're running out of time. Um, but <laughs> I'm sure you and I could talk for another hour if we really wanted to. Easy, easy. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Especially with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank no, you. It was, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. And thank you for having me. It's it's always an honor to come on the podcast. I think you guys are doing an amazing job. Keep it up. Uh you know, if you guys, you know, check out PCEA.org, uh, check us out. My Evolve, get, be a part of the collective. It's, um, uh, you'll see us, you know, uh, uh, with our recent acquisition of, of UP Media, you'll, you'll see us a lot more than, than years past because, you know, we're only two years old, but it's amazing how fast we're growing. You figure our 17 chapters and, uh, you know, all the amount of uh, our affiliations uh, that we have. It's, a, it's truly amazing. How things are evolving for PCA, so definitely be a part of the collective, so we can help share that knowledge and, and pass that on to the new generation. Absolutely, yeah. We'll have a link to the show no- in the show notes to uh, to the PCEA website, so so everyone can mm-hmm. learn about this important organization. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for being with us, and uh, to all of our listeners, check out uh, everything in the show notes. Uh, go register for All Team Live if you haven't already. It's going to be great this year. It's back in person in San Diego, and I'm excited to be mm-hmm. there. Stephen, I hope you're going to be yep. there. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's that's the plan. Uh, last time we talked to Judy, so uh, it, it'd be good. I'm excited. I'm always excited. Uh, a lot of great great individuals out there. Uh, some really great content at LTM Live. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a hell of a show, so definitely want to be there. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, everybody. Thank you again for tuning in. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, if you're out there listening, don't stop learning and stay on track. <laughs>